thank you. It's nice to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm sorry I don't speak German. And also, I tend to speak fast, so if you're not following along, just wave at me and I'll try to slow down uh, because I know not everybody is fluent in English. Um, I'm going to tell you a story uh, about Iceland. Um, it's a, a small country in the North Atlantic. Uh, it's about 100,000 square kilometers with 300,000, 320,000 inhabitants. And uh, what I'm going to do is go a little bit over uh, what happened in 2008, uh, the crash, or I'm going to start the story there, the public protests that took place, um, the constitutional process that followed, the referenda that we've had um, since then. Uh, we've had now one almost full term in parliament. We have elections in two weeks, so it's been a very... Uh, uh, well, a very steep learning curve that we've had in the last four years with uh, uh, participation by the public in, in politics through referenda and the constitutional process, and then maybe draw uh, some lessons from it. Um, the crash uh, is what we call, uh, what, what many people elsewhere talk about, the crisis. We talk about the crash, we, because what happened in Iceland over the course of 10 days was the three banks which uh, between them had uh, multiple times the uh, national uh, domestic or the gross domestic product, um, they, they collapsed in, in just the course of 10 days. So it was a very quick and fast process, process that we went through. Um, the, uh, the government obviously was unprepared for this. Uh, we now know that in the months before the government uh, the cabinet ministers had taken the time to go abroad and, and tell uh, foreign creditors that the Icelandic banking system was sound, that it was not going to collapse, or that there had been indications of what was coming, but the government refused to look it in the eye. And um, uh, we are now struggling to get uh, a transcript of a conversation between the then central bank governor and, uh, and the prime minister, where, uh, where the decision is made to give a huge loan to Kripthing Bank uh, two days before it crashed. Uh, uh, and, that, and that was the big, the, the really big collapse. Um, what the, the people felt what happened after that was really that the government was not taking uh, action and, uh, and people of course were uh, almost paralyzed. And uh, within a little while, there was a lot of protests taking place. This is the prime minister at the time. This is, uh, uh, this is the moment, uh, this is our Kennedy moment in Iceland. Uh, where were you when Gerhorde gave this talk? Everybody can tell you, everybody who was over the age of 10, I think, at the time this took place, October 6, 2008, can tell you exactly where they were when Gerhorde said, may God bless Iceland. For one thing, because we never invoke God in politics in Icelandic. So um, we knew then that we were really, really going to uh, you know, hit, hit uh, a difficult time. Um, Geras, uh, or Prime Minister Horde's uh, uh, cabinet did not seem to be doing very much. I'm sure they were behind the scenes, but in public it really was, um, it was invisible. Uh, their actions were not uh, apparent to, to the general public. So within two weeks of the crash, um, the, the final bank fell on, on October 8th. Um, within two weeks of that, people started gathering outside of the parliament, uh, protesting. I'm just going to show you one picture here. This is what it looked like. Uh, people standing outside the small, in the small square outside of parliament with homemade um, protest uh, banners demanding the resignation of the government, um, the uh, removal of the central bank governor who uh, well, he, he is, he's basically been the king of Iceland for as long as I have had the right to vote. Um, he, was, he became prime minister in 1991, served until 2005, then became foreign minister, then became central bank governor, only to be removed in 2009, and now he's the editor of, of the biggest uh, newspaper in Iceland. So uh, he is a, a, um, he's a very influential personality, and he tries to direct the way we think about politics. Um, and uh, he's a very right wing, and he, he brought privatization to Iceland, the Thatcherite policies. Um, these, the, the protests were um, 
the, the protests were very focused on the removal of the government, on the, uh, the removal of, of the uh, central bank governor and the central bank governing council. But one of the other demands that came out of, of the protests was a demand for increased transparency and the rewriting of the constitution. And this is something that people always find a little odd, is why would you need to write a con new constitution because of a financial crash? There's not a direct link necessarily, but the crash showed us that there were problems in our system, that we did not have um, a way of checks and balances, that the political system was able to create uh, legislation that nobody had, uh, or, or regulation, that nobody had uh, the ability to, to counteract. So if you had a political executive system that said you can privatize the banks, you don't need the banks to have uh, reserve schemes or anything, uh, that can happen and nobody can do anything about it. And where do you go to fix things like that? Well, we go to text, you know, so the Constitution was uh, something that, that people were starting to demand. Uh, the protests culminated after, after quiet, uh, civic, you know, obedient uh, protests every week, every Saturday for three months. Uh, the parliament is reconvening on January 20th, 2009. Um, most people remember the day because that's the day Obama took office in the US. Um, in Iceland, we were standing in front of the parliament with our pots and pans because the first issue on the agenda of the parliament was the legalization of alcohol sale in grocery stores. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, they'd been on a Christmas vacation for a month, and that was the thing they thought was most important. And Facebook went wild, uh, SMS texts, you know, the, the demand on the uh, phone system was incredible. People were demanding, you know, we have to go and stop these people. These people in parliament have no idea of what really matters to us. Our currency is, is held captive, uh, our loans are, are spiking, um, food is, is getting more expensive, and they're going to talk about this. So people gathered in front of parliament with pots and pans, so this has become very famous. We just stood out there for a day, a day and a half, uh, protesting. They couldn't work uh, within, uh, in, in the fall, in the uh, evening of, uh, of the 21st, uh, tear gas was employed on protesters because things were getting very rowdy. Um, and this took a little bit under a week before the, the government collapsed and resigned. Um, the a minority coalition took, uh, then took, uh, uh, took office on February 1st, composed of the Left Greens and the Social Democratic Alliance. So this was the first left-wing government uh, in Iceland uh, in the history of the Republic. And, uh, and they then won the, uh, the uh, elections, which were held in April of that year, and became a majority coalition and have despite everything, have actually sat now for a full term. Um, they currently have the support, combined support of 25% of, not even that, 23%, uh, I think the most recent poll says. Uh, so they are going to get blown out of parliament uh, in two weeks unless something major changes. Uh, but one of the main promises of this government was that we were going to rewrite the constitution and that they were going to try to be more transparent and more democratic than the previous uh, government had been. Um, these are the, just examples of what the protest turned into here. Um, the, uh, the, the, the main promise uh, of the Prime Minister, our current Prime Minister, Johanna, uh, was something that she had been fighting for for 30 years. Uh, as a member of parliament, she is now retiring at age 70 after 35 years as a parliamentarian. Um, she had, had been, from, from her very first days in Parliament, she had been trying to get the constitutional process out of the Parliament and, and into the hands of the public. Because she said the politicians cannot be trusted to do this. These are the rules about the way in which they work, we work as a politician, and we need, uh, we need to give the public a, a, more, a stronger hand in this. And I think for her, uh, the, the crisis uh, surrounding the economic crash really opened up this opportunity. So she had attempted, uh, along with her, the minority government, to start the process already before the elections, but they were unsuccessful. So in the fall of 2009, they, pro they proposed uh, a, a legislation on a constitutional assembly. And that process then started in, in 2010. Um, the, uh, the process started with this uh, civic assembly, 
where people were drawn, uh, 1,000 people were randomly drawn from the uh, statistical uh, national registry. Uh, everything was taken into account for uh, possible uh, representation, where you lived, how old you were, uh, women and men, uh, in equal re representative numbers. We were invited to come to the city for one day. People were paid uh, for travel and, and so on, and for the day. Um, if they needed to travel, that was compensated. And uh, very close to 1,000 people uh, accepted. A uh, few hundred uh, volunteers also served to help. People worked on uh, round tables, uh, bigger than these, but the same idea. And there was a, a, a table chair that sort of uh, moderated the discussions and, and brought out, and, and then people rotated between, the, uh, between tables, and then they developed uh, an idea for what uh, a constitution, what, Icelandic, uh, what the Icelandic constitution should look like, and what the, were the values it, it should entail. Um, everybody was able, as long as you were over the age of 18, you were a possible candidate. Uh, one of the jokes, one, one of my friends was uh, a table chair, and she said there was uh, 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 somebody in, in her, on her table who was 90-something, and she had been an alternate. There was another 92-year-old woman who had been called and said, would you like to come? And she was a little too sick and didn't think she could, so, but then her son called and said, he was 70, can I come in her place? Like, no, 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 we need a woman over the age of 90. Um, so no men in their 70s, thank you very much. Um, so, you know, so this was really, there was an attempt of trying to make sure that, that there was a representation, no matter, you know, what, what category you would, would be representative of, everybody's voice would be heard. After this, um, there was a, an expert committee, and the expert committee actually organized this seminar, but then they took, uh, or this, this uh, workshop day, then they took the, uh, the uh, pr results from, from this, uh, this uh, assembly, and they prepared a document which was to serve for the Constitutional Assembly as a guideline. What, is, what does the uh, Icelandic nation want to see in its, uh, in its constitution? What do we want to uh, get written into this text? And they were uh, largely, this group was legal and constitutional scholars, but also some uh, civic leaders, um, a poet and uh, an environmentalist and so on, just different, uh, so different ideas were also represented there. They wrote these legal analyses of the current constitution, compared it with uh, neighboring countries' constitutions, with the new constitutions of, for example, South Africa and uh, Ecuador and, and so on, where, where they've been doing some more uh, radical work on, on their constitutions, and, uh, and proposed ways in which the Constitutional Council could probably go. When they're doing this, so these are a lot of processes that are going on at the same time, uh, along with this, there's a constitutional assembly election. And there's no connection between the civic assembly, the 1,000 people, 1, people, and the 525 people who ran for that. Everybody over the age of 18 was able to say, I want to run, I want to sit on this council. And there was an election in late November in uh, 2011, uh, 2010, where, um, uh, where uh, yeah, people had to elect 25 representatives out of these 525. The elections were very problematic. Uh, for one thing, there was, uh, the, the media was overwhelmed by the number of, of candidates, so they decided instead of trying to cover it, they would just not cover it, because that's fairer. Um, and the uh, public national radio, even uh, only two weeks before the elections, they said, okay, well, we have to do something. So everybody was invited to come in and record a five-minute uh, response to three standardized questions. And then if you turned on the national public radio for the week in advance of the elections, there would be a voice responding to the same exact three things, just for, you know, running on a loop. So not very, you know, adequate representation. The, the press, the, the printed press, uh, some of them even decided that they would not print articles sent in by uh, any of the candidates because that would be giving them unfair exposure. So what happens, of course, was that um, largely it was people like me who are uh, fairly often on TV in Iceland and uh, have uh, names that are, are known in households who were elected. So it wasn't exactly, you know, your next door neighbor who, who got elected. Um, but still, it was, um, you know, a fairly diverse group. 
the Constitutional Assembly was the first time in Iceland there was a rule that the representation would have to be at least 40-60 for men and women. Um, the, in, but instead of having a quota, there, there was 25 seats. If uh, one, uh, if, if either men or women were, were more than 60%, they would add uh, representatives of the other sex until they had an equal representation. So we could have been 27 or 29 or 31 or even up to 35 if that was, if, if the population elected only men, they would continue adding women until they would have a fairly, uh, fairly fair representation. So this was also uh, one of the innovations. Now the elections were problematic and they were finally uh, voided because of, of uh, practical problems. Uh, you did not close uh, a curtain behind you when you voted and the ballot was, um, you, you didn't mark an X in front of the people you were electing, uh, which is not in accordance with the law in parliamentary elections. So there were a lot of problems with the way in which this worked. The elections were voided, and finally in January, uh, in, in January there were, th this happened, 2011, we were supposed to start in February, and uh, the government in March decides to appoint the people who got the most votes in the election if they were willing to accept an appointment. So we became a constitutional council instead. And we started working in April and continued working until in, uh, in July of, of 2011. Um, this is a picture from the, uh, the Civic Assembly where people were uh, deciding on the, the values and so on. And this is uh, the, the council, the way in which we worked. Um, this is my, my group uh, working with guests from other groups. Um, the, the Constitutional Council, we, we start, when we finally start in April, we were uh, dealing with not just the uh, problems remaining from the crash, this uh, atmosphere of distrust um, in, in all government decisions, uh, lack of transparency that people perceived and so on. So we decided that we wanted to work in as open a manner as we possibly could. Uh, we did make one um, decision, however, that we would have our group meetings were closed, the small group meetings, because we wanted people to be able to change their minds. Because if you make a statement in public, often you're going to feel like you're committed to that statement, even if you get better arguments uh, that might persuade you, because then you look weak, you know, nobody wants to be like John Kerry in 2004. Um, and. Uh, um, so, so finally, we, we decided we would, uh, we would have everything, we would have everything online that we could. We would uh, have our council meetings open, we would broadcast them, and uh, because people are, were so tired, uh, you can't tell right now in Iceland, of course, with the elections coming up, but people were really tired of partisan bickering, where uh, political parties would be entrenched in, in a position and arguing, and that it would always be a majority vote that ruled, and so it was just a question of who had the majority at what time, what decisions would be made. So we decided that we would work on a consensus. Um, and we worked in three groups, and the, the, the three groups approached this a little bit differently. Um, I was the chair of my group, and we decided that we would never take anything out of the group uh, unless everybody in the group at least could accept to discuss it in public. Um, so no proposal was made if anybody was absolutely against it uh, in the name of the group. Uh, there, was, there was a couple of issues that in the group we did not reach a consensus that I took a very uh, strong point against, but not, then just not as a representative of, of my group. Um, and, uh, and this is one of the things that I think we need to learn from, um, at least in Iceland, is that you know you can try to continue discussing things until you reach a compromise that people can accept. Uh, for example, we we found a, a a compromise on the status of the church in the constitution that the two priests in my committee could accept, uh, priests of the state church. Uh, they were they were willing to accept a compromise, which you know the parliament has never gotten this far, and they just want to vote on it. The, a vote can, you know, can break a consensus very quickly. Um, so, so that was the way that we worked inside of, of the council and in the committees. Um, what we did as well was we, we decided, you know, there had been this great interest in the, in the civic assembly, in the, uh, in the elections, even though the, uh, the elections had, the, the turnout was quite low, but the, the discussions around it was not reflective of that. And we thought we really need to let people have an impact on what's happening. 
And actually, a lot of the people who had run for the uh, Constitutional Assembly participated extensively in the online discussions. So we set up our uh, web page. Of course, we got you know five days to do this. Uh, when we finally were appointed, we had to start working five days later. Um, and uh, everything that we wanted to do, we wanted to work on open systems and, and open platforms and so on, but um, we also had to take speed into account, so we chose the Facebook system for commenting. And Facebook, of course, is a closed, proprietary, you know, this has all the negatives of uh, big corporations, but they have a built-in plugin. You can put it on your website, and, you know, it's really easy to use. So we decided for speed and, uh, and instead of uh, a principle in that one. Uh, but also because 80% of the adult population is in Iceland is on, on Facebook. So it's <laughs> everything happens on Facebook in Iceland. So you know, if, if it, it's not on Facebook, you know, right now we have the, the head of the Social Democratic Alliance and the head of the Progressive Party, which is leading in the polls, they're having a debate on Facebook on when, the, when or whether they're going to have a debate. So, and everybody can watch this because everybody can follow them. So, so uh, Facebook is, is very, very open. There's, a very, there's very few people who are not on Facebook, so we had, uh, you could sign in using you know, MSN logins and Yahoo logins and so on. That was a possibility as well. You could send us an email, you could write us a letter. Uh, so we got about 300 formal letters by either email or, or post. Uh, but we had well over 3,000 comments and commenters, um, you know, very active commenters, who were participating in our Facebook discussion. Uh, and considering we're a country of 300,000 people, that's, you know, it's actually quite a, a good participation. Um, and um, uh, again, it varies between committees. Um, my, my committee, I think, was uh, fortunate in the sense that we had the issues that most people were interested in. We had human rights and we had the natural resource section. And this was a very active, so we got disproportionate numbers of, of these comments were directed towards us. And, uh, and one of the lessons, I think, uh, to draw from this is if you want to have an open discussion like this, you have to have somebody who is dedicated to monitoring that discussion and being responsible for commenting, or, you know, responding to it and, and making sure that people feel included if you're trying to include them. Um, for the first five or six weeks, the, we, we did not do this correctly. And people started complaining, you know, we're sending you these comments and, and you're not giving us any feedback. And we're like, well, but look, our document now reflects your ideas, you know. But we didn't go in and say, hello, I have responded. We have taken this into account. So that was something that we really needed to do. Um, so mostly we worked in, in these groups, a uh, group of eight. Um, the people around the table are, are mostly my group, and then the people up against the wall are uh, not in a meeting in their group at the moment, so they came to, to listen to us. And, uh, and then... Uh, for two days out of the week, we would work like this, um, and then one day out of the week, we would go, and all of the groups would be together, but the discussion was led by one group. And then uh, Thursdays and usually Fridays, uh, at least part day, we would have open council meetings where everything would be, again, online and so on. Um, before we went into the council meetings, we took the text that we had been developing the earlier part of the week, we put it online. Um, and shared it with, uh, uh, with the public. We promoted it. We did YouTube clips that we posted online and uh, talked about what we had been doing, what the ideas were, and so on, and tried to you know, gear up interest in that way. And our Facebook page uh, had well over 5,000 followers, uh, and, uh, and this was the main way in which that we distributed what we were doing. Um, we then submitted our proposals. This is a picture, uh, the banner picture is, is from the day we submitted our proposals, at the end of July 2011. And we gave the proposal to the Speaker of the Parliament, uh, and the proposal was then submitted to the, uh, uh, to the Constitutional Committee of the Parliament, where it went into a very long process of uh, legal analysis for a whole year. Uh, whether the uh, ideas we were proposing were consistent with uh, judicial process and uh, or uh, maybe too radical or, or uh, too conservative. I don't think there was any issue of, of that. Um, uh, and then it has been discussed in, in committee, in parliament, uh, now off and on for two years. And this, uh, this current uh, parliamentary year, since September, uh, this has been, I, I can't even count the number of meetings that they've had, but they've been extensive. Um, 
The process, however, sort of came to a halt. Um, I'm going to come back to that in a little bit and talk about the other uh, side process that has been going on where people have gotten more involved in politics is with the referenda. I'm going to go through this very quickly and maybe just more in uh, the workshop later. Um, the, the government does not have a strategy per se of, of increasing the number of referenda, um, but there has been a consistent demand in the follow, following of the crash that people get, get to be more involved. And we, don't, we didn't, at the beginning of this term, have a formal process for referenda, except for the president to refuse to sign a legislation. And then the, the law that he refuses to pass goes to a referendum. And most, member, most presidents have considered this an inactive clause in the Constitution because it had never been used until 2004 when our current president used it. And, um, and, and then that's the same president who a year and a half, two years earlier, refused to refuse a law, even though there were huge petitions uh, trying to get him to block or at least send to a referendum the decision to build these huge dams in the east of Iceland. But then he uh, made this decision in 2004. It was a, a law in the media. So there was uh, a precedence. So when the ICE save bills uh, came, to the, uh, came, came from the parliament to the president, 30,000 signatures were gathered um, asking the president to refuse to sign that, uh, which he did. And there was a referendum in, in uh, 2010 uh, which refused that bill. Uh, the, the government went back and tried to renegotiate, brought another bill back, which was passed in Parliament with all, you know, no, no uh, objections, if I recall correctly. Um, and the president still refused to sign that. Um, and uh, so we've had these two referenda, which were against the will of the, of the government, but with the people using the way that they had to pressure the president to push this to a referendum. The constitutional process, however, was put to a referenda in October last year. And um, there was a 50% participation rate, much lower than in the, or not much lower, but lower than in the ISAF uh, referenda. Uh, but still uh, for a referendum of a fairly uh, decent turnout. And uh, two thirds of those who showed up said, we want a constitution based on the proposals of the Constitutional Council. So we want uh, this work to continue. And that was in October, but the, pro the proposal was not brought out until the end of, uh, of February. And then it never really got on the issue, uh, on the agenda of the parliament. So parliament really has, has failed in, in getting this on the agenda and discussing it. Um, these are examples of the ISAF, uh, you know, like uh, this is the then fin finance minister presented as the, uh, as the uh, what's his name? Smeagol, uh, yeah. <laughs> so yes, uh, you know, my precious. Um, on October 20th, uh, this, a friend of mine took this picture from the balcony of her house in, in the hills. Somebody had flown up and drawn an X, you know, go vote. Uh, so, you know, people do weird things when they want to activate their, you know, neighbors. Uh, go out and, and vote on the, in the referendum. Um, so, like I said, 50% of the people did, but the parliament really um, did not uh, follow through. Uh, there were a lot of, of, uh, of activist groups. This is an environmental group uh, saying, you know, say yes to the proposal, specifically to the pro proposal on natural resources. Make sure that one gets passed. And that is one of the biggest problems, is that our proposal uh, challenges the status quo when it comes to the, the ownership of, of uh, or who can profit from natural resources in Iceland. And that is one of the big problems we're facing. Um, what we, um, I think what we are, are sort of trying to uh, learn from this is, you know, the, uh, uh, the, this process, the constitutional process, has, uh, it has, has, has been successful in a lot of ways. You know, it's shown that we can work uh, in a different manner. It's possible to work on a consensus approach. It's possible to involve people uh, via online processes to, to activate them in, in public discussions and so on. Um, but the completion of the project has not been a success. Now, uh, right before the end of this parliament, the leaders of the, of the uh, government coalition parties submitted a proposal saying, okay, it's clear we're not going to get this through parliament. So now they changed the clause on how to change the constitution. 
And that's the only thing that was passed after all this work. Um, you know, thousands of people having participated in all sorts of, uh, of projects. Um, the only, uh, you know, it, and it shows that, you know, they, that you, you can use the parliamentary system to block a discussion and you can uh, prevent change from, from taking place. Um, in Iceland, we're very focused on that part at the moment, and I'm uh, maybe being a little idealistic, but I think it's also important to focus on the learning part, what has happened, um, the positive part, is that we have shown that we can work together in unusual fora to, uh, to bring public discourse a little bit, uh, you know, a step for forward. Uh, the tendency to use the referenda, however, I think has sort of shown that, um, you know, if, if you bring an issue to a vote too soon, you're not going to uh, resolve any conflicts. The, uh, the, the current political situation in Iceland is very much reflecting the ICEVE cleavage, the, the way that people sort of took a side on ICEVE and some, to some extent on the Constitution, reflects where, where they are in politics at the moment. And these really are two groups that are not talking, they're not talking to one another, they're not speaking the same language almost. And what happened um, in the end, this is uh, from the last uh, protest meeting, uh, pushing for the passing of the, the uh, Constitution, the head of the Constitutional Committee of Parliament giving a talk, describing the work that she had been doing for the last two years in Parliament, and the opposition that she had met. And this is the state that we're at right now. It's a little sad, but you know, if we try to focus on the learning, the lessons, um, I think we can still learn quite a bit from it. Thank you.